I talk with Chris Hedges, the Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and host of On Contact. He sat down with me to go over the, the, the collapse of the mainstream media, the continued rise of deep state, and whether we have any reason to be hopeful. Here now is that interview. Chris, thank you so much for joining me here. Uh, I'll just jump right into it. You know, we're, we're in the midst, midst of this fervor of hatred toward Russia, but the mainstream media seems to, to have no interest in talking about the fact that even if there were proof that, uh, you know, they somehow outed the Podesta email through WikiLeaks, which I've seen no proof, but even if there were, the mainstream media doesn't seem to mention that, A, if the, you know, the emails revealed corruption, so if you don't want your corruption revealed, don't be corrupt. And B, the mainstream media get five billion dollars of free airtime right. to Donald Trump, and that's twenty-three times as much as Bernie Sanders during the primary. So, aren't they as equally responsible for a Trump presidency? They, they this it gets no mention. Yeah, completely. Um, I mean, it was a cash cow for them, and right. the head of CBS admitted it. Um, yeah, I mean, the whole. I find it all reminiscent of the uh, manipulation of the press to invade Iraq. Right. Um, I don't know whether the Russians hacked Podesta's emails, but I know there is not a shred of evidence. And yet, uh, across the media spectrum, they are hyperventilating. Uh, you know, what Rachel Maddow calls this a blockbuster. I mean, she's just uh, all of them. Right. And there's no there there. That's number one. And number two, when you parse it, it's the whole idea that tens or hundreds of thousands of Clinton supporters woke up one morning and read the Podesta emails and decided to vote for Trump. Either that, <laughs> right. or because they spend seven pages attacking RT, and they wildly inflate, you know, RT's media influence. Either that, or they watched RT and decided to vote for the Green Party. They're both, that's really what it boils down right. to, and they're both equally ridiculous. But what this is about, I think, is much more insidious. Yeah. Because uh, it is, first of all, about the deep state, Republican and Democrat, trying to discredit Trump uh, and uh, essentially tarnish him as being a puppet or an agent of Vladimir Putin. Right. I mean, remember that immediately after the election, who was the boogeyman? Who was? It was Comey at the FBI. Right. But it's kind of hard to demonize the head of the FBI. It's a lot easier to demonize Putin. That's number one. Number two, it is part of this uh, and we, we will go back to the Washington Post article, Proper Not, which is a shadowy gonna, website, right? It's, it <laughs> it's about yeah. shutting down the voices of dissidents. And I watched the hearings with uh, McCain and Clapper. What was interesting, not what Clapper said, where he uh, talked about how uh, RT gave voice to people who questioned, uh, you know, our human rights or whatever. It was the, the vitriol, the anger but with which he said it. Right. Um, and so it's part of the campaign to discredit those of us who are dissidents, especially figures like Julian Assange, others, Ralph Nader, Medea Benjamin, who have already been pushed so far to the margins. I mean, public broadcasting in this country has collapsed. Right. Uh, you could go back to the 1960s. You could see Malcolm X, Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn. All of these people were the Black Panthers. I mean, Huey Newton, even. Um, that's gone. Yeah. It's, it's basically underwritten by the Koch brothers and ExxonMobil. And, uh, and so it's that. It's also this need on the part of the war machine to demonize Russia because they are earning billions of dollars in Eastern Europe with the expansion of NATO. Which, which gets, you know, the weapons uh, military industrial complex also speaks to deep state and how that all keeps rolling along. Uh, I, I want to jump to, uh, we can get back to proper now, but I want to I jump to, you know, you're saying this is deep state worried about a Trump, an outsider of the political establishment getting in there. And I find every once in a while I talk to an odd type of person that is a fan of mine, maybe a fan of yours, and they agree with everything we say, and then they go, thank goodness Trump got in there because, you know, he is, he is outside this ruling elite and he's going to really shake things up. Right. Well, that shows an utter lack of understanding of where power actually lies in this country. Uh, and it doesn't really lie with the executive branch. Uh, as we saw, I mean, that's why there was complete continuity on almost every issue between Bush and Obama, with this caveat. Obama's 
assault on civil liberties was actually worse than right. under George W. Bush. Right. Of course, he expanded the drone, the militarized drone wars, you know, attacking uh, people in countries we are not, we've not declared war with. Mm -hmm. uh, he pushed the interpretation of the 2001 authorization to use military force act as giving the executive branch the right to assassinate American citizens. And of course, I'm talking about Anwar Laki. Yeah. And his son, his 16-year-old son. So, and uh, the the assault that you took him to court about. I did, yeah. I did, and we won, much to his surprise. And and then uh, they appealed. But this was over the uh, destruction of the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act uh, through a section, a section 1021, inserted into the National Defense Authorization Act that permits the military to carry out acts of domestic policing. But even more than that, not only can they, uh, in essence, carry out extraordinary rendition of U.S. citizens on U.S. streets, but they can hold them in military facilities and strip them of due process and keep them there yeah, indefinitely. No trial or charges. Right. And right. so uh, that, the, the, this, is, this is where we are going and where we have been going for a long time, regardless of whether it's been Bush or Obama. Mm -hmm. And Trump does not come into power with a fixed set of beliefs. He's very protean. He's a showman probably a con artist. Um, he's not a figure like Sessions, right. who, uh, you know, basically waves the Confederate flag and laments, probably goes home at night and watches Birth of a Nation. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, he's, but he's surrounding himself with those people. Trump is. Yes, he is. But, 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 but that's the difference. I'm not sure Trump has any fixed beliefs. Right. And it's clear that the deep state, uh, the security and surveillance apparatus, the war machine, um, all sectors of the deep state, re Democrat, Republican, are going to put the screws on him to ratchet up or continue uh, this aggressive posture towards Russia, um, partly because there are uh, large sections of the U.S. economy, i.e. the defense industry, for whom this is a huge profit-making venture, and it's going to be very hard to uh, exact uh, large amounts or extract large amounts of money from, you know, the budget of Poland unless they can keep this specter of Russia as a threat. So I think for me the difference between Clinton and Trump is that Clinton would have landed and, the you know, the green light would have been flicked on and, and, and she has long held this posture. Uh, I think with Trump it'll... I, I could be wrong, but I, I, I don't think so. I think with Trump... What we've got is just a delay, but I think it's still going to come. Well, and in a way, does it does having someone like Rex Tillerson, CEO of Exxon Mobil, as Secretary of State, does does something like that? Does it take the does it draw back the curtains on the corporate state when you have? I mean, in a way, does it reveal it for what it is when you have the literal CEO of Exxon Mobil as Secretary of State? Yeah, it does. It's it's kind of the ugly face of white supremacy and American exceptionalism and imperialism, which is what Trump is. And, that, you know, that's part of the reason they dislike him so much, because he's, mm -hmm. he's a national embarrassment. He's an international embarrassment. He dropped, uh, he dropped the dog whistle and brought out the actual words. Yeah, and um, he's kind of the raw face that they seek to hide. Uh, but whether the policies will be radically different under... I think they will be different in this sense that... Uh, Internal repression will probably be uh, fiercer mm -hmm. and less, and, and there will be less room for uh, people who dissent. Uh, they will be more aggressive about dealing with groups like Black Lives Matter. But look, I, I was out at Standing Rock, and yeah. uh, they were firing rubber bullets. They were firing CS gas. CS gas blinds you and burns. One woman skin. nearly lost her arm. One woman nearly lost her arm. They're firing concussion grenades. These are against nonviolent protesters. Right. Uh, so it, it's it's incremental, but it's been incremental. Uh, right. I don't I don't see massive changes. Um, I do think that they want to get rid of Trump, uh, and I think that they, you know when they, this whole uh, intelligence report and attempting to kind of paint him as a puppet of the Russians, it stinks of the kind of psyops operations that I used to cover in Latin America, uh, and and I think that that the machinery of the deep state will be used to marginalize Trump to such an extent that they can finally get rid of him through impeachment. And then have Pence in, which... <laughs> right, it doesn't necessarily... It's not because they love democracy. Yeah. Uh, it's not necessarily going to make things better. Um, uh, 
but I, you know, he doesn't come out of that class. He, he's not out of power and cycle through the Council on Foreign Relations and then back into power. I mean, it's, C. Wright Mills writes about that. It's just a completely hermetically sealed, circular... He skipped the revolving door. Well, he never was in it. He's not yeah. part of the estate. Yeah. He doesn't come out of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you talk about the, the crackdown of dissent, and, it, and it, it's been going on. You know, it's not like it, Trump would be the original <laughs> version of this. Um, but I wanted to talk about, you know, Reverend Billy, a uh, well-known activist, is on no, trial no, no, right no. now in no. Iowa uh, for protesting, nonviolently, of course, right. uh, against Monsanto. And in that trial, they're seeking what may be an unprecedented ban, I don't know, on the First Amendment defense. In their motion, they wrote to the judge, the state of Iowa requests that the court preclude evidence or argument regarding free speech rights, free expression, right to assemble, and or other First Amendment arguments. Like, is this a ramping up of, of restricting of rights, of freedom of well, speech? Well, that's already been imposed through terrorism laws on Muslims who are charged. Special administrative well, measures. Real Americans. Yes, so. there you go. Okay. Sam. So uh, this is the danger. When you essentially create a system where rights become privileges and you have revoked those rights for demonized segments of the society, poor people of color, I mean, any African-American in a marginal community does not live in a democracy. They live in a kind of mini police state that maintains control through terror, through mm -hmm. murder, through, the, through indiscriminate sh killing of unarmed civilians and mass incarceration and a court system that's farcical and everything else. So you, when, you, when, you, when you create both the legal and the physical conditions for that for a demonized segment of the population, it becomes, Hannah Arendt actually writes about this in Origins of Totalitarianism, it becomes very easy at the flick of a switch to impose that on the wider society. And I think that is always where we have been headed. Um, but I think it will be accelerated under Trump administration. And I think that the example that you picked out is, is a good one to show that how this is expanding beyond the borders of those demonized groups. Right. Well, and I just love the idea that anyone could go in front of a judge and say, exclude the freedom of speech well, argument. It's, right, but that's what Sam's are. I mean, you, you yeah. don't have attorney-client privilege. You don't have... You can't meet with your lawyers to prepare a defense. That's legal. Yeah. And, of course, this also, since it's against Monsanto, shows the power of the corporation. Oh, Monsanto's, the... yeah. I mean, there you go. I mean, you, you, uh, you know, I'm a vegan, and, but, and largely for environmental reasons. Yeah. But the animal agriculture industry is so fierce uh, that there are gag, ag gag laws, they call them. Right, you, you can't right. even talk about uh, the environmental impact of livestock in terms of methane emissions and pollution and everything else. Yeah, you can't. It's illegal to film them yes, abusing it is, animals. It's, That's right. It's amazing. Um, before we run out of time, I wanted to get to something you say in your book, uh, Wages of Rebellion. You say, I don't know if we can build a better society. I don't even know if we'll survive as a species. But I do know that those corporate forces, that the corporate forces have us by the throat, and they have my children by the throat. I do not fight fascists because I will win. I fight fascists because they are fascists. Can you talk a little about what it is to have hope without optimism. Right. Well, uh, I, uh, you know, that's kind of Camus in a way. Um, American society has a kind of mania for hope. Mm -hmm. This is Oprah. This is Hollywood. This is the Christian right, positive psychology. Yeah, you, you can do anything with positive thinking, right. so therefore, right. don't. And, and so reality is it. never an impediment to what you want and what you're going to get. Well, this is kind of what, you know, children think. Um, <laughs> and we have to grow up especially yeah. in the issue of climate change. Things are, I mean, Noam Chomsky is now, who I admire immensely, of course, right. is walking around saying, it's over, we're doomed, it's finished. And everybody's going, he's so bleak. And No, no, he's describing our reality. We can't effectively resist until we ingest what is actually happening around us. And it is very bleak and mm -hmm. very frightening. Um, and we may not succeed. Right. Uh, but I write this uh, as a father or four children. And I at least want my children to look back and say, he tried. Yeah. We have a moral imperative. That's the, you know, the wages of rebellion, the moral imperative. We have a moral imperative to stand up for, you know, without being melodramatic life. Mm -hmm. um, and we may fail. Uh, but the, the consequences of doing nothing, um, I think, in, ensure, finally, the extinction of the human species, and probably a lot sooner than we think. 
Yeah, I think there is an incredible imperative, and you you look at you know uh, people want to argue about the science, but fifty percent of mammals have gone extinct right. in the past forty years. Right. Uh, you know, we're in the middle of a great extinction. Right. And well, you know, and, and every time you read a climate change report, they say, "Oh, it's accelerating at a rate far faster than, than we, we predicted." This yeah. is especially with the melting of the polar ice caps. So, um, yeah, we're in a very precarious moment in human history. And um, unfortunately, these corporate forces uh, have a complete lock on power. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have lost the democratic institutions that made reform possible. There are no institutions left, including the Democratic Party, that can be authentically called democratic. Uh, and we're going to have to rebuild from scratch. And it's going to be difficult. Uh, and, and we're going to have to do it with, without this mania for hope, um, this kind of false optimism, because actually that, that lulls us, I think, into inaction. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, when they're calling those who stand for revolutionary change uh, traitors, uh, well, they are. you know, call me what you want. I'm going right, to keep right, doing right. it. But thank you so much, Chris. Yeah, I really appreciate thanks, this. Lee.